Oh yes, prepare for some ranty panties in a twist. So while Shinobi and I were busy being freaks on the Tales of the Crypt having party, I noticed that Amy Castor via Decrypt had published an article that pulled quotes from Balaji Srinivasan, the ex-CTO of Coinbase, after he spoke during Coindesk's uh, consensus distributed conference, which I didn't even know was going on because I don't care. Um, <laughs> the article is titled, Ex-Coinbase CTO, Government Surveillance is a Necessary Evil. So yeah, take a deep breath, everyone, because this is going to be a long one. In the article summary, uh, it says, Balaji has been relentlessly tweeting about the new coronavirus since January. He is in favor of decentralization, but he is also a pragmatist, he said, and he believes aggressive testing and tracing requires surveillance. So in the interview, um, or at least the quotes that they pulled um, in a kind of interview format, he goes on to say that... Um, this is something for which the government of South Korea has been applauded. That is only because the country accepts a heavy use of surveillance technology, notably CCTV, and the tracking of bank cards and mobile phone usage. More liberal countries, such as the U.S., may be less willing to accept these types of measures, end quote. Hmm. I wonder why. I wonder why more liberal countries are less willing to surrender their privacy to the government so that their speech and social activity can be controlled. Can you put your finger on it, Shinobi? Wasn't there that thing with that guy about seven years ago that not only showed how extensively the U.S. government was invading our lives, but that all of the surveillance had little to no value in terms of solving actual crime and instead uh, weaponized sociopolitical uh, powers to manipulate us domestically and in forward policy. You know, I think we should forget about all that because it's been seven years, right? Surely they've learned their lesson by now. What's that, Lassie? The U.S. Senate is voting to reauthorize the Patriot Act and give law enforcement agencies access to web browsing data without a warrant, dramatically expanding the government's surveillance powers. All right. Oops. Um, then the kicker in the interview, he, uh, and he doesn't see a quick blockchain fix to the problem. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, what a relief because, you know, instead of paying some Silicon Valley dipshit thousands of dollars to build a state-of-the-art healthcare location tracking DLT solution, he helped enable millions of dollars to be funneled to former hacking team management for doing good old blockchain surveillance. Bad choice. Yeah, um, when this first started... I actually had a little bit of respect for Balaji because he was bringing a bit of common sense to analyzing the science of this situation. But as far as all the shit that he has been talking in terms of response or policy or what we need to do as a society, he's lost his goddamn mind. Like, I don't give a shit. If the bubonic plague is sweeping this country again, like, no, I am not bending over and giving permission to surveil every aspect of my life to judge whether I am a model citizen or not. Get fucked. I will never give my permission for that. I don't care what the fuck is going on. That is a foundational principle of these liberal countries, of a place like America. And I don't care how out of line the actual government is with those principles. I am not going to give them permission to be that out of line. Fuck that. Yeah, so uh, it gets even better. Um, he is also quoted as saying, it is easy to get a centralized solution up and working in a short period of time in a pandemic and an emergency, and the surveillance apparatus is already in place. The NSA is already surveilling Americans, said Sir Navasan, and has been since at least 2014. That must be a major typo, or he's an even bigger idiot than I thought. Um, that was after NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden exposed the agency's data collection tactics. So at least we should get some benefit out of that, he said. We should get some benefit out of that. 
we should get some benefit out of the decades of illegal mass surveillance programs that were exposed as ineffective and unconstitutional. We should get some benefit out of a literal international conspiracy of nation states to route around their own domestic due process and privacy laws to subvert human rights, mislead the public into endless wars that only benefit their political dominance in the military industrial complex. And we should get some benefit out of that because this system was designed to do something other than benefit the common good for people like us and it would never benefit us um he also argued that the key is not to position contact tracing as a bad choice in a vacuum instead the public ought to consider it a less bad choice given the spectrum of bad choices that are available oh yes the tired old lesser evil argument that's currently being bludgeoned into the heads of anyone who doesn't feel like voting for the blue sexual predator stormtrooper, because God forbid if the red sexual predator stormtrooper stays in office, even though we're perfectly willing to give him more executive power and expand the surveillance state. Yeah, of course, that's not weird at all. Um, and then he says, it's basically like fighting a war, he said. Once you are in peacetime, you can hopefully back off on these kinds of policies, end quote. Oh, what's that, Lassie? Oh, yeah. The Patriot Act was signed into law in 2001 in response to September 11th. And even though the U.S. has officially withdrawn from Iraq which they wrongfully invaded and occupied for a decade, somehow the Patriot Act is not only still around, but we are apparently reauthorizing it, and your so-called representatives are allowing it to be revised into something even worse. Uh, and then he ends, yeah. Once we are in peacetime, you can hopefully back off. Um, yeah, once we are in peacetime, as if they, hasn't, they haven't been postponing peacetime indefinitely, for as long as I can remember, because in the words of George Orwell, Oceana was at war with East Asia. Oceana has always been at war with East Asia. So when exactly are they going to back off? That is the big question. Yeah, I mean, dude, like, come on, dude, you eventually you won't have to choose between getting groped or getting a small dose of radiation anytime you travel. Just, just go with it. Just go with it for a little while. It's OK. Like, just we, we need to do this, guys. It's for the greater good. Yeah, and uh, this thing keeps on going. So uh, also the article states, he didn't spell out how cryptocurrency would help people backtrack from heavy surveillance, however, but then again, it was a short interview, end quote. And that's the last quote I'm going to say from the article. And yeah, so Balaji can keep the rest of his naive thoughts to himself, and I will bring up some counterpoints that dispute all of this garbage. Um, but yeah, keep in mind, this guy was the CTO of Coinbase until last year, May 2019. You know, the CTO is supposed to be responsible for the, you know, technical roadmap of the company, and, you know, sometimes can deal with security stuff as well. Um, so for those of you who are still using Coinbase, how does it feel that this guy had access to your personal information? I wouldn't feel good. Um, but anyway, counterexamples. Uh, there was a study published on May 13th with authors from MIT and Cornell University on, quote, Americans' perceptions of privacy and surveillance in the COVID-19 pandemic, which found, quote, widespread reluctance among the public, support for contact tracing apps is lower than for expanding traditional contact tracing or introducing new measures like temperature checks and centralized quarantine using a uh, con using a conjoint analysis experiment embedded in the survey we find that privacy preserving features including non-location tracking and decentralized data storage increase the public's acceptance of contract tracing apps um, there was another study published on the same day by authors from Johns Hopkins University Microsoft Research and the University of Zurich titled how good is good enough for contact or how good is good enough for COVID-19 apps the influence of benefits accuracy and privacy unwillingness to adopt um, and they found that if contact tracing app if a contact tracing app were to exist that was perfectly accurate perfectly pri and perfectly private up to 88 percent of Americans would be willing to install it now, you may be thinking, wow, that's a really high percentage. But then when they were asked uh, whether they would install it, if there was any chance of errors in accuracy, privacy, or both, 
it dropped to about 20 to 30 percent who were giving it the green light with 70 to 80 percent who were either uncertain or said outright no. Uh, Furthermore, if there was a possibility that the data could leak to their employer, willingness was at 27 percent. Uh, to the U.S. government, 26% to a technology company, 27% to a nonprofit, 29%. So in conclusion, unless you can basically guarantee perfect privacy and accuracy, which I don't think anyone can, um, with no leaks to employers, no leaks to the government, etc., only about a third of the population will consent to these apps, according to this study. And then in terms of demographic variance, the researchers note that those who identify as Democrats are nearly three times as likely as those who identify as Republican uh, to be willing to install an app with privacy risks. Finally, those who are younger and women are more are less likely to report that they would install an app with privacy errors. So if you're a young person or a woman, you're not going to risk it um, or you're more you're more likely to say, I'm not going to risk it. Um, meanwhile, in the Land of Reason, there was a great article published on the same day, actually, as the one about Balaji by Alex Gladstein, um, titled COVID-19 and the Normalization of Mass Surveillance. Um, it's a really great article. I'm not going to read the entire thing because I've already talked about this story a lot already, but, um, he begins by saying, like, the idea that phone apps should be popularized or even mandated to fight outbreaks is techno-utopian. Based on optimism rather than evidence, the real impact of such an approach on society wouldn't be better immunity, but rather the acceptance and creeping growth of an even more powerful and omniscient global surveillance state. Um, And then at one point he talks about the fundamental flaws with Bluetooth tracking methods, which is similar to the criticisms that we mentioned in episode 215. Um, He wrote that virtually all smartphones run on Android or iOS, Uh, or run Android or iOS, more than one-third of the world's population can end up in Apple or Google's tracking system, and yet, as of today, few, if any, independent studies prove with evidence that phone uh, contact tracing has, all things being equal, been a significant factor in stopping COVID-19. In Taiwan, public health authorities have said that their mass surveillance strategy combining cell phone location data with user health data was only useful in one case. In Israel, the government recently announced it would stop using phone tracking to monitor quarantine individuals after it wasn't useful. I have to scroll one second. But doesn't Netanyahu also want to put tracking bracelets on children? Yeah, I mean, they're they're, they're moving in that direction, but um, who knows if that, I, I, don't, I don't know if that was uh, part of their statement that it wasn't useful, but... Uh, He also notes in Singapore, a city state often praised for its technological prowess, the government revealed even in its own propaganda that phone contract tracing is meant to be at best a supplement for traditional contact tracing and not a replacement. Meanwhile, their omniscient mass surveillance system has failed to stop an ongoing outbreak. Um, And then he also mentioned China has a mass surveillance system and yet they didn't stop COVID-19. A recent briefing in The Economist concludes that authorities would only be able to get the accuracy they need to stop COVID-19 by mixing Bluetooth tracking with location data, CCTV data, and communications data, which would defeat the privacy-preserving approaches in the first place uh, with an omniscient panopticon. Um, And they says, we must also grapple with the fact that the government with the most intense citizen uh, surveillance system in history, the Chinese Communist Party, couldn't, despite all the Orwellian tech in the world, prevent an outbreak, untold deaths, and economic devastation. In fact, the CCP knew about the danger of COVID-19 outbreak by late December, but instead of using its enormous spy powers to quash the virus, it decided to try and cover up the outbreak, censor medical reports, and hide evidence. Local officials even ordered the destruction of novel coronavirus samples and arrested whistleblower doctors who spoke up about the danger of the emerging virus. Funny how whistleblowers are always getting the short end of the stick when uh, all these governments are claiming that we need mass surveillance. Um, So before we get too excited about defeating COVID-19 with phone tracking apps and mass surveillance, ask yourself, do we need them and will they work? The answer is no.